I read a portion of Revelation for obvious reasons. It talks about a spiritual Babylon, a Babylon the Great. And it uses the actual destruction of Babylon as a picture of what God will do in the last days. I also wanted to read it because when you read Revelation 18, or rather 17, 18, and 19, with the exception so far of the blood of the saints and of the martyrs being committed by this Babylon the Great, I can't help but think that while I don't think America is the woman who rides the beast, Babylon the Great, there is enough similarities between the two to make us Americans concerned about what God has in store for us. Because there seems to be a lot of divine charges against this Babylon the Great and those who committed immorality, sexual immorality in particular with her. That makes us concerned and makes us exhort maybe we all should be concerned and approach this as we are all Americans. When I talk about Babylon and Belshazzar and why God gave judgment unto this king. And I think overall fundamentally what God, why God judged Belshazzar was his pride. But I want to hone in to a particular manifestation of that pride, which is willful ignorance. Because in many ways, I'm afraid that our country, and even ourselves as believers, can live in part and for a lot of unbelievers, completely in willful ignorance. I believe that we have, to a degree or fully, but on purpose, hence the word willful, on purpose blinded ourselves with the pursuit of happiness and the clamoring after gold and silver, which are, we, as we read in the text, Gold and silver seems to be symbols of prosperity. Bronze and iron, symbols of our power and pride. And wood and stone, which is symbols of our provision and our peace and our comfort. And these are the same idols that Belshazzar, the king of Babylon, blessed these gods with items that belonged to the Lord. I will read later, and you'll see that. And I'm afraid that in America, we do not fear the judgment of God, whether in a cataclysmic event or just in our lives, the hand of God judging one by one large groups of people or maybe our country as a whole. We do not fear that coming judgment. We act like this woman who says, I am no widow, I am a king. I, am, I sit as a queen. We do not think evil could come upon us. And that's Belshazzar's attitude. He did not think evil could come upon him. We still, though, remain a fearful people. And I, like, we, we so, we, we can oftentimes, and I talk about Americans in general, we can get so angry and bitter when mundane, normal things happen to us. A family, a, a, a car breaks down, or there's a health crisis in our life, or a car accident, or perhaps we have a wayward child, or a wayward spouse, or some other crisis involving sin, and we can get so fearful and bitter and angry about that. Perhaps there is a, a departed family member. Or sometimes it could be as simple as the weather did not cooperate with your plans. 
or there's some bureaucratic red tape that is holding you up from something. And we could think that God is against us in these situations when really these situations are against our gods of prosperity and pride and power and comfort. We have this idea, this expectation of a prosperous monotony and that things should not go wrong in our life. And it's because we're pursuing those things rather than pursuing the Lord. Rather than focusing on our relationship with God, the spiritual state of our soul and our family's soul. Our role in the church and in the community. Rather than focusing on things that would bring judgment or might bring blessing upon our country. Instead of focusing on those, we can get so distracted on purpose and be ignorant from those things and focus instead on the things of this world and what makes our life prosperous and normal. A status quo we unhealthily and unspiritually expect. Our pursuit of God and our obedience to his word ought to give us peace in the midst of these normal mundane. What I mean normal is our life ends with death. That's normal. We die. We have a story here on earth. We live that story, and then we die. And your friends and your family members live that story, and they die. And sometimes that story has bad news in it. Sometimes you overcome that. Sometimes you don't. Sometimes it ends in death. Sometimes it ends in sadness. But we have a story we're living. And it comes with crises. But we'd rather live in blindness, in ignorance of what, who's really guiding that story. And what the storyteller wants us to think about. And I'm talking about God. We would rather focus on the things of this life than thinking, what is God trying to tell me in this? But we blind ourselves from what's obviously in front of us. It's our pride, our lust, our covetousness, our idolatry. They keep us from that. My plan today is, the examine, is to examine the things that Belshazzar, Belshazzar, King Belshazzar, should have known. That we may be aware of the obvious things that we should know. I want to make known what it was that blinded Belshazzar from seeing them, in the hopes that I can open your eyes to the things that blind you. And while I hope that God's word, and I trust not my own words, will back you into a corner, I want you to know that there is a back door in that corner. And there is a door handle. And we have a Savior who knocks. And the way to open that door of escape from God's judgment is humble repentance and faith towards God. I want to read verse 27 of chapter 4 from last week's sermon. Daniel says to Nebuchadnezzar, Therefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable to you. Break off your sins by practicing righteousness and your iniquities by showing mercy to the oppressed, that there may perhaps be a lengthening of your prosperity. I want you to know there's a back door. But, and, and I want you to know that, I mean, Paul says in Philippians that if anything, you be otherwise minded. If you're not aware of certain things, if you're willful ignorance, if you by faith follow the Lord and pursue him, he will reveal even this unto you, Paul says. And that we should keep our mind towards the goal of the prize of the high calling of God through Christ Jesus. But I want to focus in this sermon on the fact that the devil is a prowling lion. 
and the world and the flesh fight and war against you to be willfully ignorant of what God wants you to do. And to, sadly, to be willfully ignorant of his coming judgment on sin. The devil fights against that. We ought not to be surprised. Unbeliever, believer, we ought not to be surprised when we fall into various trials and temptations. It's an expected part of life. So I want to teach us to open our eyes. Let's read this chapter. Daniel chapter 5. King Belshazzar made a feast for a thousand of his lords and drank wine in front of the thousand. Belshazzar, when he tasted the wine, commanded that the vessels of gold and of silver that Nebuchadnezzar his father had taken out of the temple in Jerusalem be brought, that the king and his lords, his wives and his concubines, might drink from them. Then they brought in the golden vessels that had been taken out of the temple, the house of God in Jerusalem, and the king and his lords, his wives and his concubines, drank from them. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Immediately the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace opposite the lampstand. And the king saw the hand as it wrote. Then the king's color changed, and his thoughts alarmed him. His limbs gave way, and his knees knocked together. The king called loudly to bring in the enchanters, the Chaldeans, and the astrologers. The king declared to the wise men of Babylon, Whoever reads this writing and shows me its interpretation shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around his neck and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Then all the king's wise men came in, but they could not read the writing or make known to the king the interpretation. Then King Belshazzar was greatly alarmed, and his color changed, and his lords were perplexed. The queen, because of the words of the king and his lords, came into the banqueting hall, and the queen declared, O king, live forever. Let not your thoughts alarm you, or your color change. There is a man in your kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. In the days of your father, light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods, were found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father the king, made him chief of the magicians, enchanters, Chaldeans, and astrologers, because an excellent spirit, knowledge, and understanding to interpret dreams, explain riddles, and solve problems were found in this Daniel, whom the king named Belteshazzar. Now let Daniel be called, and he will show the interpretation. Then Daniel was brought in before the king. The king answered and said to Daniel, You are that Daniel, one of the exiles of Judah, whom my father, King, the, father, the king my father brought from Judah. I have heard of you that the spirit of the gods is in you and that light and understanding and excellent wisdom are found in you. Now the wise men, the enchanters, have been brought in before me to read this writing and make known to me its interpretations, but they could not show the interpretation of the matter. But I have heard that you can give interpretations and solve problems now if you can read the writing and make known to me its interpretation, you shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around your neck and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Then Daniel answered and said before the king, let your gifts be for yourself. And let your rewards to another give. Nevertheless, I will read the writing to the king and make known to him the interpretation. O king, the Most High God gave Nebuchadnezzar your father kingship and greatness and glory and majesty. And because of the greatness that he gave him, all peoples, nations, and languages trembled and feared before him. Whom he would, he killed. And whom he would, he kept alive. And whom he would, he raised up. And whom he would, he humbled. But when his heart was lifted up and his spirit was hardened so that he dealt proudly, he was brought down from his kingly throne, and his glory was taken from him. He was given from among the children of mankind, and his mind was made like that of a beast, 
and his dwelling was with the wild donkeys. He was fed grass like an ox, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven until he knew that the Most High God rules the kingdom of mankind and sets over it whom he will. And you, his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, though you knew all this. But you have lifted up yourself against the Lord of heaven. And the vessels of his house have been brought in before you. You and your lords, your wives and your concubines have drunk wine from them. And you have praised the gods of silver and gold, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which do not see or hear or know. But the God in whose hand is your breath and in who, and whose are all your ways you have not honored. Then from his presence the hand was sent, and this writing was inscribed, and this is the writing that was inscribed, Mene, Mene, Tekel, and Parson. This is the interpretation of the matter. Mene, God has numbered the days of your kingdom and brought it to an end. Tekel, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Paris, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Then Belshazzar gave the command, and Daniel was clothed with purple. A chain of gold was put around his neck, and a proclamation was made about him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. That very night, Belshazzar the Chaldean king was killed, and Darius the Mede received the kingdom, being about 62 years old. Oftentimes we study and preach on good men of the Bible. Oftentimes we preach about their faults. This is different. We are going to examine the life of a wicked man. And it's good to ask when studying the life of a wicked man two questions. How am I like this man? And am I this man? So we all commit sin. Sometimes we even scorn. Sometimes we act stupid. But to the degree these three things mark your life, to the degree we can wonder whether we are number two. Are we Belshazzar? Am I just like him? Not do I oftentimes act like him sometimes, but this marks my life. I could have been him. Both questions have the same answer in that they require repentance and asking God for forgiveness. But the second one requires more. It requires the Holy Spirit to convict you and to convert you and to make you a new creation. Because if sin and scorning and stupidity mark your life, sin against God and scorning him and stupid about his ways... You need a heart changed by the Holy Spirit. And I challenge you after the sermon, if you're wondering whether you're one or the two, to go see a pastor and ask him about it. This is a serious sermon, and I pray that it is not your writing on the wall, because when God wrote on the wall for Belshazzar, it was too late. He quaked and trembled and found no room for repentance. Judgment was upon him. But I hope that this is like your mother sitting you down and telling you a story about your grandfather and saying, he went through this. And Daniel, came, a prophet came and told him the interpretation. And he humbled himself and understood the Lord and pursued after him by faith. Again, Jesus stands at the door and knocks. And if by humble faith and repentance you open to him, he will come in and dine with you. I'm going to, ask, I'm going to show you eight things in this sermon that Belshazzar should have known. 
Number one, he should have known that the enjoyments of life cannot prevent judgment. Verse 1 of chapter 5, Belshazzar made a great feast for a thousand of his lords and drank wine in front of the thousand. This was a great party. But you may not know what is going on in the city of Babylon at this time. King Cyrus has united the Medes and the Persians together. And he is surrounding the walls of Babylon. And that night, he's just about to take it. He has a secret plan. He's withdrawn. Maybe this made Belshazzar think to himself, I'm fine. Seems like they're withdrawing. But he withdrew his troops to build a giant dam on the Euphrates River. The Euphrates River went underneath the wall of Babylon. These walls were super thick, as thick as from that wall to that wall. And they were double walls. Could not take the city. But Cyrus had a plan. Dam the river, move the water in a canal around it, and behold, there is an underground way under the wall to get into the city. They didn't think of that, apparently. And so while this story is going on, it may even be that the troops of the Persians and the Medes are heading straight towards the palace. So keep that in mind as this is going on. Judgment is coming. Belshazzar should have known that he was in a dire situation. This may have been a mercy in many ways to the poor of the city. The troops just had an open access to the palace, and it wasn't going to be a fight block by block and building by building. Belshazzar was probably still worried. I mean, he was surrounded by his enemies. The great Chaldean Empire was falling. But he used wine and feasting to put away that knowledge of likely judgment. Oftentimes we can take things and use them to ignore what God wants us to know. And that he is a God who judges. And it doesn't have to be bad things. Wine was not a bad thing. Wine is, an, is, is a part of feasting and celebration. But let, let's use another example. Let's say your hobby is to write poetry. I hope there's someone whose addiction is writing poetry. And you can, like, put away the serious spiritual matters of life, God and his will and his future for you, by writing poetry. The same thing could be done with evil and sinful things. What you look at, what you do. King Belshazzar chose to do that. God instead wants us to use our members, as Paul says, as instruments not for unrighteousness, but for righteousness. He wants us to present our members, our bodies, ourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life. And our members, our hands, our eyes, as instruments of righteousness, because for those who have believed on Christ, sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under the law, but under grace. Don't ignore God by your hobbies. Another thing Belshazzar should have known is that God will judge the vain and selfish uses of his graces. God has graced us with many blessings. And I speak in particular to this place, this church gathering we're at. I don't mean this building, this gathering of the saints. In the Old Testament, the house of God centered around a temple. And they used silverware and cups and utensils and other things to worship God with. And this King Belshazzar He should have known what he was doing. He should have known that the Lord had power over kings. He should have known what God did to Nebuchadnezzar. But instead, he drank wine, and for some reason, Yahweh, the Lord of Israel, came to his mind. And he's like, you know what? I know that there's like, hundred, there's like thousands of cups 
in, the tre tre in, the, in my grandfather's pantheon. Let's bring them here and we will celebrate with them. He used the Lord's graces and the Lord's blessing, the Lord's cups of gold and silver for his party. And oftentimes we can ignore the true things of the Lord, yet still gather together in a church. Perhaps it builds a reputation. Perhaps our friends are here. We're using the gathering of the saints for our own gratification. You enjoy this, not, in a, not because you enjoy God, but because you enjoy people. You enjoy the prosperity it brings. It may not occur to you, but the Lord's saints want to be diligent and not lazy. And they tend to be prosperous oftentimes. And there are people that want to gather with the Lord's saints because they see that prosperity. And only because of that, gather. And perhaps if your flesh is enjoying Christian living, you maybe want to reconsider your walk. If you're not facing hardship, if you're not like the rich young ruler having a desire and willingness to put away all your riches and to give to the poor so you can follow Christ. If, you're, if the blessings God gives you in your life does not include persecution, perhaps you need to reconsider your walk. What new area do you need to sanctify? Are you using God's blessings, God's instruments for your own pleasure? God loves gold. He loves to bless you. But there's a verse in Ezra. Ezra is, the Jews came back from this captivity. And, it is an int and they brought with them these utensils. And also other things from the temple. And it says in Ezra 3.3, 3, They set the altar in its place, for fear was on them because of the peoples of the land. And they offered burnt offerings on it to the Lord. Burnt offerings morning and evening. Fear was on them because of the peoples of the land. And they knew what to do with these temple paraphernalias, these temple instruments. They worshipped and brought offerings to God with them. And they brought prayers to the Lord because of the fear of the peoples of the land. They knew that grace and blessing comes from proper use of God's means. And when we gather together as a church and we celebrate the things of the Lord, we preach the word, we take the Lord's Supper, we fellowship around him. We are asking, and we pray together, we're asking the Lord, bless us by the proper use of his graces. Belshazzar should have known the temporality of gold, silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. His grandfather did. His grandfather knew not to touch those instruments. He left them there and instead blessed the oppressed of God's people. His successor, King Cyrus, knew that there's a proper place for these instruments. And he gave them back to the Jews and said, go back to Jerusalem and rebuild your temple. It is said of Cyrus, the king of Persia, Cyrus said to the Jews when he did that, the Lord God of heaven has given me all the kingdoms of the earth and he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Among is, whoever is among you of all you people, may the Lord his God be with him. Let him go. And it's interesting, he says, and pray for us. Another king said later, Darius the Great, that they may offer pleasing sacrifices to the God of heaven and pray for the life of the king and his sons. Later, Artaxerxes, another king of Persia, said, let it be done in full for the house of the God of heaven, lest, his wrath, lest God's wrath be against the realm of the kings and his sons. Belshazzar should have been the same way, but instead he used the God's graces to gratify his own desires and to ignore the judgment of God. What oftentimes can result when we do not use the graces of God that he gives us in love and obedience to him is we can then, after a while, become angry at the thorns that God has put in your life. They don't humble you. They make you bitter and angry. They make you want to define and blame God and abuse his servants and services. 
because they're no longer giving you that temporal pleasure and comfort. God's music, God's exhortations, God's books, God's examples, God's ministers are not for our own pleasure and gratification. The joy we receive from today's gathering and the worship we have just done and will do makes us holy. They result in integrity and uprightness, a clean heart resulting in holy living and love to God and the brethren. Remember that. Belshazzar forgot that. Not only that, but he, he, he was willfully ignorant Number three, that God will judge the blasphemous use of his graces. We, we read in Revelation 18, this exhortation to the saints of God, come out of Babylon the great, come out of her lest you partake of her sins. Why, why do I say that? Belshazzar didn't just use the things of God for his own gratification, he thanked and praised the gods, the idols of gold, silver, bronze and iron, wood and stone. He used God's people and God's instruments of grace to make, to, as a thank offering to prosperity and pride and strength. He sought, to, he sought and recognized the need for himself to be built up, that he himself was built up, and he used God's instruments to do that. He praised the gods of gold, silver. And watch out, there are evil teachers who use Christian items and blessings and grace to make money off of you. Watch out for those people. How do we know if someone's doing that? When you read a book or watch a video, hear a sermon, and you're not so sure you need discernment, is that person ignoring certain things that, or making me ignore certain things about the judgment of God? Is this a false teacher? Remember, Belshazzar, under the influence of wine, thought, I am going to take Jehovah's stuff, Yahweh's stuff, and thank the gods of silver with it. And there are false teachers that do the same thing with the Bible and with church and with all things associated with it. How do we know? It's a good question. Let's go to number four. I'm going to answer it in point number four. How do we know if people we listen to are abusing God's graces? Number four, Belshazzar should have known that the counsel of the ungodly discerns not God's judgment. It says in verse 7 of chapter 5 that the king called loudly to bring in the enchanters, the Chaldeans, and the astrologers, the wise men of Babylon. He promised to promote them, but verse 8 says, they came in, but they could not read the writing or make known to the king the interpretation. They were not able to discern what God said. What did God... So, so there's two different opinions on this. One is, it was a different... It was unknowable, and you needed the gift of interpretation to see this. The other is that they were blind or afraid to tell the king what it is. But what, did, what was this hand from God doing? I want, I want the, this, this is, I, I, I've listened to a couple sermons on this. Um, a man by the name of Robert Duncan Culver talked about this several years ago, I heard it. I also read up another article by David Instone Brewer, and his supposition is what God wrote was not Hebrew or Aramaic, but rather an old non-phonetic alphabet called, or non-phonetic writing, kind of like hieroglyphs or like Chinese characters, called cuneiform, where they used wedge-shaped devices. And I want you kids, you kids could do this here. Um, this is what one of them thinks. So if you kids have a Bible or something hard, I want you to take that Bible right now, 
go ahead, something, something like a surface. Put it in your right hand. That'd, that'd be this hand on this side, of this side of the building, but your right hand. Remember, put your right hand. And I want you to take your left hand, and I want you to put your three, your pinky, your ring, and your middle finger on the surface of the Bible, like this. And put your index finger kind of on it, but almost not yet. And we're going to make a fist by squeezing our four fingers together and then squeezing our thumb together. So we're going to take our fingers like this, and we're going to squeeze the four fingers together and then squeeze the thumb. And so one person thinks, and I'm intrigued by this, that when you do that, you make this mark. Your three fingers make these marks. Your index fingers makes that small cuneiform, and your thumb comes across. And what Belshazzar thought was a fist came from and went like this and did this and formed a fist and made a mark on the wall. Cuneiform, you could read with it, but it was oftentimes in this time, because Aramaic came along, it was a phonetic alphabet, very nice to have phonetic alphabets, um, but they still used cuneiform for financial transactions. And oftentimes it meant something monetary, and I'll get into that on the next point. But at the very least, perhaps the wise men should have came and said, oh, that looks like a fist. <laughs> that doesn't look good, Belshazzar. But I think they not only feared Belshazzar, he still had the power of Nebuchadnezzar. He could still just say, you're dead. But I think they were probably optimistic just like that. And it didn't occur to them that that looks like judgment. They just probably stood there and said, well, I don't want it to be judgment. It, but I can't, no, that looks like someone took their hands and did this. I can't tell. Again, it could have been Aramaic and, and something. I don't know, but this is my best thought. Belshazzar should have known that you cannot get any counsel from the ungodly. Oftentimes, the problem with secular and many Christian books is they don't see that your problem is sin and God's judgment. They don't write their books and give their counsel in light of deal with your sin and do something before God judges you. They don't write books to Christians and believers saying you're still fighting and battling this war against sin. They write things to prop you up, to make you feel better, to get along in this weary world to fluff the pillows and move the deck chairs as the ship is sinking under the ocean. So I ask the question, how do you know if the Holy Spirit is behind the book I'm reading? Jesus says in John chapter 16 that when the Holy Spirit comes, he will convict the world, this is verse 8, of concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. The Holy Spirit guides us into all truth, including those truths. Does the book help you get over your sin? Does the book promote the righteousness of God and exhort you to be righteous? Does it warn you of judgment to come? To the law and to the testimony, Isaiah the prophet said, if they speak not according to this word, it is because they have no light. When they say to you, inquire of the mediums and the necromancers who chirp and mutter, should not a people inquire of their God? Should they inquire of the dead on behalf of the living? Beware of listening to those who have no light in them. They may promise gold and silver. They may promise prosperity and power and comfort but they speak in the name of dead, silent idols, and they hope to get you to join them in their willful ignorance of God. Belshazzar was not getting any answer from these people. And thank God for his mother, 
I believe it was his mother. Time out. Why, why, did, why did Belshazzar say, I will make you third ruler? It's because his father was actually the king. And he was, they two reigned together. But his father was off in Arabia doing some sort of religious pilgrimage for years and left his son in charge. Belshazzar should have known... Okay, end of the timeout. I, I want to say that because this is important. Belshazzar should have known that God's law and prophets should direct our steps. The Bible that we read comes from the right, proper perspective, which we are so oftentimes blind from. We are oftentimes willfully ignorant, and we don't know it. That's why we need God's word daily. That's why we need God's law meditatively, lovingly, in our hearts, that we may be shown the path of righteousness. Daniel had a distinct advantage over these wise men. I'm going to talk about it in two weeks when I go through Daniel chapter 7. But a few years prior to this, Daniel saw a vision. And he might have been thinking about this vision when he, saw, when he walked into the room and saw this mark here. Um, if you, you don't have to, but flip a couple pages to Daniel 7, verses 24 and 25. Now, I think this is talking about the last beast, not the first beast. But he says, As for the ten horns, out of this kingdom ten kings shall arise, and another shall arise after them. He shall be different from the former ones, and shall put down three kings. And he shall speak words against the Most High, wear out the saints of the Most High, and shall think to change the times and the law, and they shall be given into his hand for time, times, and half a time. And perhaps Daniel came into the room and thought, okay, Nebuchadnezzar died. There were three kings immediately after Nebuchadnezzar, but those three were plucked up and had very short reigns. And now the king, now there's two half kings ruling over. Thought, may have thought that. May have thought of, hmm, time, times, and half times. And maybe he just came in and thought, Judgment. Judgment. Or maybe you just saw it look like a fist. I don't know. He may have been thinking about that vision he received years earlier. You can go back to Daniel chapter 5 now. Nevertheless, because Daniel had a mind that was rich with the word of God, and he prayed daily that Israel would return to the promised land, and he thought of God's law day and night and meditated on it lovingly. That when he comes in and sees the interpretation, his heart is ready to hear from God. His heart is ready to give the interpretation. And briefly put, if you were to say, if you were to look at these as financial transactions and it were pronounced them out loud in Aramaic, the way you'd pronounce it is mene, or it's a note for 50 or 60 shekels. Another one, mene, 50 or 60 shekels. Another one that looks similar to mene was tekel, which is an Aramaic way of saying shekel, and that's what that means. And then when you see a small one, that's half, half a shekel. In other words, a shekel is about um, a 50 cent piece, only pure silver. And a half shekel is a quarter. That's kind of what a shekel and a half shekel is. And he would have saw that, and it would have said, shekel, or mene, mene, 50, 50, one, and then two halves. And he used the word play to interpret it. And I don't understand all of it, so I'm not trying to make it out like I'm an expert. Uh, I'm just reading from the text. This is the part that we know is true about this symbol if that is indeed the symbol. But regardless of what the symbol was, here's how Daniel interpreted it. Mene, God has numbered the days of your kingdom. Does it occur to you that God measures our sin? That God measures the results of our life? 
And like Belshazzar, when we are weighed, tekel, we are found wanting. And judgment comes. And to Belshazzar in particular, it says, you have weighed, been weighed, have been found wanting, and your kingdom is divided. So instead of one shekel, it's two shekels. And the Medes and the Persians co-reigned over the empire. Your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. What the other wise men were blind to, Daniel could see. And it is by the power of the Spirit, whether indirectly because of his loving and faithfulness to God's word, or God just gave him the interpretation as he saw it, whether it was written in cuneiform or Aramaic or Hebrew or some other language, the point is, we should not be willfully ignorant of the fact that go to God's people for instruction and learning. Be in God's word on a regular basis. Show up to church and hear God's word on a regular basis. It'll keep us from being willfully ignorant of the things that God wants us to do, whether judgment or blessing. Number six, Belshazzar was willfully ignorant of past providences. We have to back up here. Both Daniel's mother, I'm, I'm sorry, both Belshazzar's mother and Daniel reminded Belshazzar of things he should have known. Do you remember your grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar? I think his father, um, whose name escapes me, probably married Nebuchadnezzar's daughter, and Nebuchadnezzar, who is called his father, is his grandfather. Or it might have just been Nebuchadnezzar is your big predecessor. He's all of our father. Nebuchadnezzar was the one who made Babylon what it was. But that story that we heard preached last week should have been on everyone's mind. I kind of think it was on Belshazzar's mind, but in a disdainful, bitter, angry way. Like, let's bring the cups of the God who humiliated our father, Nebuchadnezzar. But he should have been warned that what God did to Nebuchadnezzar is a lesson for all of us. You should be drawing lessons from God, King Belshazzar, and humble yourself and pursue righteousness. Stop oppressing the wicked, and, or stop oppressing the poor among you and serve him. And likewise, we also should look back at our life the hardships, the mistakes, the blessings we've made, ways God has humbled us, and think to ourselves, God, I need to make my life right, and to follow those examples. Belshazzar did not do that. He was willfully ignorant, stupid on purpose. Belshazzar should have known that you cannot, number seven, you cannot bless away, you cannot bribe away, you cannot blow off God's judgment. A righteous king looks to the good of the poorest among his kingdom. Belshazzar instead threw a party for his lords and partied the night away as troops were storming his city and heading straight towards him. <coughs> Belshazzar should have seen the besieging, or at the very least should have taken heed to Daniel's interpretation and said to himself, everyone put on sackcloth and ashes. Let's wave some white flags of truce. I will lead a procession to the generals of King Cyrus and I will humble myself before him. Perhaps he will spare the poor among our cities. He should have thought of them. But he got distracted by bureaucratic busy work. Making proclamations. Daniel didn't want the promotion. He did not want the gifts. There was a reason he did not want them. 
probably didn't want to look like someone important. He wanted Belshazzar to see his humility and respond accordingly. Cyrus was a merciful king. But Belshazzar refused to. He set a decree, make Daniel the third ruler in the kingdom, because it was his father, then him, then the third ruler. And he ignored, he fought against humility. Doesn't humility hurt? We fight against it adamantly. We try our hardest not to be humbled before people and before God. Belshazzar's dignity and pride kept him from humility. He did not regard the humiliating portions of Babylon's history. And he even forgot who Daniel was. His mother had to remind him of this man. All the ways of a man are clean in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the hearts. The Lord weighs our spirit. Avoid living in your own eyes. Humbly go to God. Don't think that you can bless God's servants and decorate your house in Christian-y ways and think you can get out of God's judgment. Don't think that you can give enough money to God's work and that he'll somehow be happy or serve him so much that God will maybe take away his judgment. Don't just ignore it. Don't blow it off. Don't live in your distractions and ignore the fact that God judges sin. He will not at all acquit the guilty. It is appointed unto man once to die, the Bible says, and after this is the judgment. This, this is coming for all of us, whether in our life or when Christ comes back. Judgment is coming. Belshazzar should have known that. The last thing Belshazzar should have known, glorify God with humble repentance. Again, chapter 4, verse 27 and 28 to Nebuchadnezzar. Therefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable to you. Break off your sins by practicing righteousness and your iniquities by showing mercy to the oppressed, that there may perhaps be a lengthening of your prosperity. All this came upon Nebuchadnezzar. There's a psalm in the Bible talking about the judgment of Babylon. And the psalmist says, Let integrity and uprightness preserve us, O God of our salvation. For those of you who are believers, who have been caught off guard and have fallen because of your willful ignorance, know that when you repent and ask God for forgiveness, and continue on towards the Lord by the grace of, our, of the Son, Jesus Christ, who died in our place and rose again. Know that for those of you who live uprightly with integrity, with godliness, you will have, by God's grace, revealed to you anything that's otherwise minded regarding the things of God. In other words, that's what Paul says in Philippians 3. If anything, you be otherwise minded. If anything sways you from pursuing the high mark and goal and prize of Jesus Christ, God promises he will reveal that to you. I don't want you to live in a life of, oh, what if there's something I'm ignorant of and God's going to judge me? Just pursue after the high, prize of the high mark of God's calling and rely upon the Holy Spirit to guide you into all truth and to lead you unto righteousness. And to show you your sin, judgment, and righteousness, to, and, God, and your sin, God's righteousness, and the judgment to come. It's a promise unto you. There is a door. Open it. Let Jesus Christ 
dine with you regularly by faith and let him teach you. To those of you who refuse to heed to the words that were preached today, though you know they are for you, take note. If you walk away from this sermon ignoring everything that was said and you continue in your willful ignorance, the writing on the wall was not a call for repentance. It was a pronouncement of judgment. Those who are lost will not stand before the Lord feeling sorry for their sins when they enter the judgment. It will be godlessness in their hearts up to that day of judgment and ever after therefrom. Those who populate hell are not wishing for God's mercy. They're just wishing to escape it. But they don't want that to come from God. They're not finally humbled when they're in hell. Yes, they're humiliated and they're ashamed, but they're not humbled. They are gnashing their teeth and they are cursing God with their weeping and wailing. You need to be humbled before God. Let the Holy Spirit wake you up. Feel that conviction of your sin. Are you willing to stop your feasting and your enjoyment of this present age, your good times that you are having? Are you willing to forego the celebration of prosperity and comfort that can blind you to what God has said to you in his word? You need to forsake all these things. You need to give your payments, you need to resume your payments unto God and stop living luxuriously off of, in an indebted way from the blessing that God has given you. God has blessed you that you may humbly serve your king. The writing on the wall, let it be interpreted as my repentance. End your partying whether literal or spiritual. And walk humbly before the Lord your God. Call upon him. He is merciful and just. The righteousness of God comes by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. He died on the cross for your sins. And he rose again that you might be holy. And if you're burdened, if you're awakened to your sin, if you feel convicted of that, go to Christ right now. He has promised to save you so that you not perish, but you have everlasting life. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would give the souls in this room no rest until they find comfort in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, you may arise and...